Welcome back from the lunch. I hope you rested a little bit. Um, sorry for all the delay. We have some technical issues with the size of the uh, slides, um, but we started it either yet. Um, if you're looking for the Cloud Foundry Day, you're right here at the bright spot. Um, my name is Christian Brinker, and I'm presenting you uh, service brokers com uh, combi combined with heat orchestration uh, templates. So uh, who hasn't heard about Cloud Foundry until now? One person who has experienced uh, more or less uh, some month with it. Okay. Um, what are you talking about? Um, Looking at uh, some software developer who wants to deploy an uh, application, uh, like our cool friend Bob here. Um, he has this cool app he wants to de deploy, and uh, then he has the question, where should I put my application to? So it's accessible to his customers or something. So he thinks about it and decides to use Cloud Foundry. What's Cloud Foundry? Cloud Foundry is a uh, container-based application platform um, organizing application life cycles, speed up the de your development process so you can easily get your application started, rapid prototyping, staging and so on standardiz by standardizing your runtime environment. And by that, and if you uh, are able to uh, produce cloud-native applications, um, you uh, can easily uh, scale your applications if you have more demand. So, if you look at Cloud Foundry, what does it provide us? It's scaling your application easily because if you want have no more uh, demand of your application, you deploy more containers, more application uh, instances. Um, you can easily um, achieve staging by nearly or uh, completely uh, um, completely uh, mirrored staging um, and production environment and also you get something like routing. You get your um, domain registered, you uh, can easily get your application accessible by that and uh, uh, you don't have to bother where to put your, uh, your access, you can easily ask your environment for it, organizing it. But what, what, where is the, uh, the problem? The problem is here. You have this cool cloud-native application, completely stateless, easy to, uh, to scale, but then you have this, this ugly friend, it's called your database. This uh, problem with this database is it's not cloud-native, so you have problems providing it as application on Cloud Foundry, um, and that's because it's holding your data. And Cloud Foundry has this mechanism called Service Broker, which is able to mine this gap, because this application needs some, uh, this, this database needs some environment which is more near uh, the infrastructure layer, because it has to be uh, cared of the persistent storage, because it has to be uh, uh, a little bit uh, orchestrated and there are batch jobs running and such things. So, in Cloud Foundry, you have an API introduced inside the cloud controller, which is organizing all the stuff here on the right, left side. And uh, also being able to introduce things like the database. But it's much more than what you can do. You can nearly all things you need for your application provided by a service broker, like log aggregation or introducing firewall rules, um, introducing matches queue, message queues, load balancer management, or much, much more. And how is it going? Um, look back um, at our ID. We have an application and we have a service. And the service lives in some service servers, whatever that it is. And what's introducing Cloud Foundry is this mechanism. You get at the Cloud Foundry uh, platform asking for 
access to some service. Um, then the platform asks your service broker, and he's getting you that for your application. For instance, um, getting your database. Um, but what it's about, uh, what different kinds of, of services are there? If you look at this, this group, you have, um, for chance, you have managed services which are organized through the platform, through the marketplace, or you want to provide apps or something you have um, to other apps. You can bind them like a database to an application, or you have something more abstract you want only to manage, but not to uh, bind to an application. Um, you have something which is, includes uh, uh, interaction with your, uh, with your routing, with your uh, transport layer or something. You have something like a draining of the syslogs and organizing of volumes. And all that of that is organized using this, uh, is organized using uh, some uh, kind of uh, interaction. You create a service broker by introducing a URL to your cloud controller. It's fetching the catalog from the service broker, yet he's knowing what services are provided by the service broker. The, if you go to your marketplace of your Cloud Foundry platform, you can see what's provided by the service brokers there, and you can create a service, which means the Cloud Controller asks the service broker for providing an instance. For example, the service broker decides to um, install a new MySQL server. Then, if you want to bind your, uh, your application against the service instance, your uh, Cloud Controller asks for a binding, which means he gets a new user on the database, he gets your password, and provides it to your application as an environment, environment variable. So as a developer, you don't have to care about how to connect your application to your, uh, to your database. It's done by the platform. You don't have to interact actively getting, oh, what was the username for my application there on that database? Don't care, you say, connect to this database, that's it. The rest is done by the platform. You only name the database instance you want to connect to. And also you can delete these credentials and remove the instance. So the whole life cycle of your services is organized through this API. And it's like a catalog of API calls, REST API calls. Um, which is now called the Open Service Broker API because the Cloud Foundry Foundation and the Kubernetes Foundation got together and said, why the hell should we organize this for each platform on itself? Services are something we have to provide for all. Applications running in Kubernetes, applications running on Cloud Foundry, so we should have, in a multi-cloud system, should have some central common knowledge about how to get a service, whatever it is, even if it's an application running on site of Cloud Foundry provided back to other uh, applications. So what does it mean? If we have a, for example, going back to our idea of the database, we may have an existing cluster, a DBMS, installed on site our IIS system, and now we want to provide it back to our, um, to our applications. So we provide a service broker organizing the access to the database, DBMS, maybe organizing in, uh, creation of databases inside the existing DBMS. Or maybe we want to deploy a virtual machine with a new installation of a DBMS system as a test instance for our developers so they don't crash on the uh, existing DBMS system we use for production. Or maybe we have this heavy load um, application which uses a really, really big, big ba uh, database on which has to be a HA. So we provide a personal cluster for this application um, which has to be there if you need it to. If we want to speed up the deployment of our production environment, this has to be automated. So we have to um, get fast a new cluster, for, it, for example. So 
REST API, service broker, management of clusters, seems to be a little harsh stuff um, if you want your, uh, something like a MySQL database or a PostgreSQL. Um, there is, in the Cloud Foundry community, several projects organizing the, the development of open source implementations of service brokers. And there are two main uh, lines here. Um, it's the, the Go framework, and here we have a Java framework. Um, there is the, the idea behind these two um, projects is that not everyone who wants to get a service broker for organizing his stuff needs to re-implement all that. Um, here I'm talking a little bit about our Java framework. We started uh, two years ago sitting around um, exactly thinking about that. At that time, everyone implemented its own service broker from scratch, re-implementing the whole API, the whole lifecycle management, every time new. If you wanted, a, there was a MySQL service broker written in Java, and then uh, someone said, oh, let's do it MongoDB service broker. So he re-implemented the, the whole stuff. And at that time we said, no, there has to be a framework for that. And we've uh, implemented it using a Java runtime environment, uh, 1.8 as microservice, standalone server, um, cloud native application using Spring Boot. Um, I hope you can see it from the colors of the Beamer. Um, if you look at our framework, all what it's blue, you don't have to re-implement. The only thing you have to care about is what does it mean for my SQL if I have a new instance? What does it mean for my SQL if I create a new uh, binding? What does it mean? Yeah, here we create, for example, if you're looking at an existing service, here that means I create a database in the DMB DBMS. Four, five lines of uh, JDBC code or SQL code you have to run for create the database, some, uh, some configurations like the, the code, uh, the codec, some uh, if you want to, what collation do you want, and so on. And here, service binding means creating a user, providing with, with the correct role. Roughly spoken. The whole rest you can reuse from the framework. So if you want to use a get a MongoDB service broker, you only exchange these parts here. The rest stays the same. Why we're talking here is, yeah, we want to run our service broker on a Cloud Foundry platform on side of OpenStack. So why do not reuse our service broker to orchestrate our OpenStack platform for providing us with the VMs and so on on the installation on side of it? Um, for example, one use case, one of our customers, we're a cloud consulting company, um, has this stack of OpenStack on-site Cloud Foundry installations. Call the, they call them MeshCloud, our uh, German-based, European-based um, service provider for uh, uh, public cloud. And they have this uh, idea of several uh, um, tinier uh, and smaller cloud providers and uh, companies with, uh, with uh, private clouds want to connect them, all running with OpenStack and Cloud Foundry and have a layer on it. So you want something like uh, a service catalog from one to the another with a seamless um, catalog on it. But underneath, the deployment is different because they differ also in the, under, uh, in the platform underneath. So you have the problem that you have to look there and there. So what we introduced is a configurable service catalog you provide your application, your service broker, you deploy on site of your Cloud Foundry installation at some provider as an application inside Cloud Foundry with the description which services he, want, he should introduce to the platform. And then you can introduce some meter information, meter data for the configuration, how to deploy. And then maybe introduce a Existing service, uh, existing cluster for management. So
so. But when it comes to OpenStack, you want also to uh, orchestrate the things. You want to do a cluster on its own. You want to say, now I want this big cluster, 10 nodes, MySQL, some kind of configuration. I have this idea in, in mind what it should be. So you came to the point where you have to say, I have to have a blueprint for it. And here, you can say maybe it's a MySQL cluster. Here, the, if we call back the right thing here, the personal cluster. The existing cluster is easy. So you can also connect your app with a service broker. You can get nearly every in, uh, kind of service broker you find open source, but that doesn't go that easy. So what do we do? We use heat. Heat is for the people here. I think it's not, not something new for the ones who is. Um, heat is an orchestration suite inside of OpenStack, which uses templating for uh, organizing resources inside of OpenStack. So you can easily um, have a blueprint about, I want this VM, I want it with this network, I want to have it a floating IP, and so on. And then I want to uh, install this script on it. And by that, you can easily um, define uh, kinds of service blueprints you want to provide to your customers. This would be like, look like here. Um, you have on the, on the top side, you have a description of parameters you hand in from the service broker to the, the heat template. Then you introduce your resource block where you define um, servers, where you define um, installation scripts maybe, and uh, on side then you define something like persistent volumes for your databases. And then you deploy it to your, uh, to your uh, OpenStack uh, installation. Um, and if you go back, it's this part of your deplo um, deployment process. Um, but that's some kind of default, uh, default domain problem. Um, maybe something more fancy, if we go back here. Um, let's say I have a custom domain for my application, which is myapplication.org. And I want to be providing it to some public cloud. And um, I want to have uh, HTTPS with TLS termination on the load balancer side. If I go to a public cloud, I have the problem that I have to provide my, my, uh, my uh, public cloud provider with access to my certificate. Because if you want to terminate, I have one slide back, I'm going too fast. Um, so you have the, your user going through the Cloud Foundry to your application, the, which is hosted in the private network. If you look back, um, the network traffic is looking like this. You go to the load balancer beforehand of your Cloud Foundry installation, then you have some Go router using the routing, um, using the, the domain management I talked about earlier. And there are two possibilities. You can have the TLS uh, termination on site of your load balancer, which is part of the load, uh, is there installed. And afterwards is done a new HTTPS connection from the load balancer to the application. Why is that needed? Because here we are scaling. You don't have this one virtual machine installed where you have this application and you know the IP address. So because you scale, you maybe have here hundreds or thousands of application instances on different nodes with different IP addresses, but they're organized with the same uh, internet address. So you catch up here the connection, terminate the TLS, and make a new HTTPS connection right to the, um, to the application instance. One variation of this is termination at the Go router, which is widely more common because you have more distance using the original certificate. But we said we don't we want to use our personal uh, certificate here. We want to provide it to the, prov uh, to the cloud provider here um, to be installed on site of the router. Um, 
if you're more into it, how to deploy uh, certificates here, it's not that simple that you have, because you can only install one certificate here and you have to use a uh, combination then that it's also working there. Um, but roughly spoken, you, it's the access here is at the cloud provider. He has access to your, uh, to your uh, certificate and can manage it. But you don't want that because why the hell should that cloud provider have access to your uh, SSH, uh, HD, uh, SSL certificate? So what you can, um, what we are working at was a cloud bro uh, a service broker providing you um, access um, of this termination process. Um, you have this, um, this, uh, this uh, blueprint um, description in the internet about Barbican with um, LBAS for OpenStack. So you can, you have Barbican, which is a security store, a secure store um, in OpenStack, which can manage securities, uh, uh, credentials and such things, certificates, um, make them accessible for applications, but does not hand over the, the ownership of it because the application comes, asks for, um, uh, with some secret, if it can use it, um, then the Barbican store um, allows it and um, it's providing it back. And this is combinable with the LBUS, with the load balancer as a service. And what we, we've done is that we can produce this combination in with a heat template. So you go, come and uh, the user gives, uh, puts his certificate in the Barbican store, secure store, um, and from that container, the, uh, an LBUS is deployed which is using this certificate. The cloud provider has non-direct um, access to the certificate. He cannot manage it, he cannot copy it, he cannot use it for something else but only with the LBUS. So it's secured that the cloud provider, if, the, if you uh, delete that container, isn't able to do something nasty with it, with it. So it's in your control to organize your certificate. And if you're going back here, what we have to do, we exchange these parts. So we introduce and say, okay, it's something different for, uh, for reusing that part of the code. We have not MySQL to install, but we have to organize some LBUS deployment and some, um, uh, re, uh, uh, some attachment of the barbican, right Barbican score, which we can provide with, uh, with properties from here. So what's the effort? Okay. Your OpenStack installation has to, uh, support, needs support for Elbus and Barbican. You need heat. Um, you have to implement some handover mechanism of the container ID of Barbican, which is more or less um, defining that the property has to be handed over to the heat template, which is nearly already there. Um, you have to implement uh, the public IP, uh, IP exposal for, for the Elbus and which is part of the heat template. Define service and service plan for the marketplace. Configure the service broker so it has uh, access to your, heat, to your heat API and deploy it. The upload for the customer is much less. He goes to your horizon or your, with his OpenStack CLI at the OpenStack, uploads the certificate to Barbican container creates a service instance, and by that, providing the ID of the Barbican store and making a DNS entry somewhere, pointing to the IP of the load balancer. And what's the most effort in this whole chain because we use a framework for it? It's producing the heat template, which people using heat more often know it's not that big deal easily done. You don't even have to use uh, a software developer for it because most ops people know how to use um, heat. And so you can fee um, speed up um, providing additional services of different kinds to your um, platform. 
So you can speed up things. You don't have to have some group of software developers in some uh, bureau somewhere producing you every new service broker, which is kind. With this, with a framework like this, you can easily um, speed up by having this, this heavy load of, of software development uh, already done, only some twitches, and then you can think about the problem itself, about the service and how to manage it. And because we're open source, like uh, most things in the Cloud Foundry for, uh, and, uh, and Foundation, um, we're happy for contribution. We're happy for uh, if you want to uh, open source your own service broker, if you want to bring in, uh, in our uh, framework yourself, if you have bug fixes, if you want to help us providing our documentation, if you have tips for us, we are happy for it. You can find us on GitHub. Um, don't, uh, if you go to, uh, we are at uh, our company's uh, GitHub page, Evola, and then CF Service Broker, Cloud Foundry Service Broker. Um, we're actually in contact with, uh, over Steve Greenberg, uh, we hope to get into contact with the original Java Service Broker team, um, which made this original blueprint and service broker so we can get it back on the, on the incubator, uh, on the uh, Cloud Foundry uh, Foundation thing, uh, project, so we get one code base back. Don't divide, positive sum game thing. Um, if you have questions, don't hesitate to contact us. Um, my email address, or gender email address, our company's GitHub account, if you have any questions, please use the microphones on the left, on the right side. So, because we're recording, so the people get it too. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Uh, just wondering if we have minutes left, I don't know yeah, exactly. Yeah, we have, I think, so, uh, if yes. you could uh, show us some, some code, I mean like YAML code or whatever you use to um, do this example deployment that you were sharing. I'm not asking for a demonstration, but to show us a little bit in a, with actually um, with actual code to see how is how would be actually implemented more or less in a rough gen, in a general mm -hmm. manner. Thank you. <laughs> so. Um, if you go to the, the web page, you have this, um, you find only the documentation of the project because we've spread it about uh, several repositories. And um, there's in the um, topics list, this repositories page, where you can find the different uh, repositories with a declaration which part they're covering from the framework. And um, if we jump right to the, where are we? We have the link, the, that part? Nah, that link, that's bad. I have to talk about with the guys. Um, <laughs> so, let's jump. Where? Have they put that? Nah. So, um, the main trick. Yeah, for sure. So, um, 
because we have Spring Boot, we have this, um, this bean mechanism, so we can provide uh, uh, several uh, connections to OpenStack on parallel. We had to uh, trick a little bit. So we can, uh, so you, your customers of your service broker can create service instances in parallel without interfering, often with you when you have some database drivers or something. Um, you have the, the problem that um, with JDBC or something, the standard clients use a, a connection to one database only. And so we have to uh, trick this here a little bit so we can connect to different uh, directions. Um, we organize it. So sorry, yeah. Sorry, I think I explained myself very badly. Uh, this is uh, the actual code of the server broker, right? Yeah. I was wondering, example of how to use it. Yeah. The YAML files that yeah. probably you have. That would be. I, I wanted to show something here ah. and ah. then jump jump there. Yeah. Um, so we have this this uh, re, uh, this uh, factory organizing stacks, the deployment of stacks. Um, back um, if you want to introduce um, a new service broker then um, we have this uh, uh, these different uh, uh, interfaces you've seen on the blue slides for uh, providing in, uh, uh, implementations like uh, new like the OpenStack platform service or the the MySQL deployment service um, there we have this trick with stack handlers. Uh, this is the raw interface. There. Um, which are able to uh, organize uh, things like image management or something we want to provide. And near, more or less organizing um, reconfiguration of some map of, uh, of properties we hand over to the heat template. So you can easily um, organize which, which images should there, which key pair, and so on, um, which is starting with the pro, uh, providing of the, of the user to the, service, uh, to the cloud controller of Cloud Foundry, the, your want to, what, which parameters you want to introduce. From there, Cloud Foundry puts them to the service broker through the, the API calls. Then they are enriched with general parameters from the configuration. They are enriched with things we introduced in the service plans. We enrich it with platform specific configuration like uh, OpenStack or something. What does it mean for OpenStack? Like a standard uh, uh, default uh, image ID or something we want to use, which is part of our property list. And then you get a stack of or a map of big, a uh, big map of, of properties, and then we go there and say, good. Um, if we want to provide a service, we have to organize um, standard access to uh, to ports because um, the list of our IP addresses, if we do not use a DNS, has to be stable. So if we run, uh, uh, kill some uh, servers, they must remain. So we have a stack uh, only for organizing ports, maybe. Then we have um, something like persistent volumes we would uh, want to keep if, they, uh, if the uh, servers are, uh, are killed and new instantiated. So we have a stack organizing volumes. And then we have some central stack organizing the deployment of, uh, of our VMs, maybe a nested stack um, organizing different kinds of servers, which is then put, uh, is provided by these original two other stacks. Um, getting the, the properties from that from the port list and from that volumes, using some software deployment, installing, uh, uh, organizing some volume attachments, and so on. Ah, slides got down. Um, and then you get a stack, complete, of a cluster. Um, I have to, had to tell about that because. Uh, you see several, uh, several templates later on. Um, so, but if you want to have it easy for test deployment, you don't care about um, 
extra ports, extra volume attachment and such on, I can show you an easy, um, an easy uh, example here on the, on the repository, um, which is not that good code because we are act actually uh, moving some code par base parts so you don't have all uh, online here. If you have more deep interest in it, call, uh, contact us. We can provide you with it. Um, we're reorganizing our infrastructure. That's because of the, the dead links in the documentation. Um, and maybe we have um, some, you see here, for example, the providing of the parameters, which we uh, got off, out of our uh, Java code provided. And, um, and code organizing our servers, for example, using uh, here, it's not the, the software deployment groups, but a, 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 some kind of script we uh, download into, into the server, which is, I say, it's some change of the code base here. Um, and some volume attachment and volume. Um, like I said, this is a te for a test server, yeah? not a cluster here. It's only for, for test purposes where if you want to have a test service. So we didn't put that much effort in that deployment. Um, in this kind of, uh, it's a Postgre, uh, so it's only here for uh, as an example because we have other code bases, for example, for more like a RabbitMQ cluster deploy, uh, organizing service broker which organizes uh, RabbitMQ, which has its own code base, its, its own uh, uh, templates, and so on. What's interesting, we talked about the red parts. Um, organizing uh, binding management in for RabbitMQ, it's more or less some organizing of the, uh, of the access of the management with the super user account of the RabbitMQ cluster. Um, it's not that much ki uh, lines of code, and the most of it you have because the standard, uh, the default, um, uh, default frameworks for organizing the, the connection don't think about uh, connecting with the one application against several clusters or several installations because they think, oh yeah, it's, it's every time the same cluster. And the pro most biggest problem when you're writing a service broker is about thinking, if we haven't this one single cluster we are organizing, we have to think about uh, multi-tenant, in parallel uh, uh, connections to several clusters at the same time with uh, different credentials and there it gets tricky. Ah, the time, yeah. If you, you have more interest in it, we can talk uh, yeah. down the floor. Yeah, thank you.